Hello everyone and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Theory Lectures. Today we're going to arrive in a promised land, that is the neutron diffusion equation. Once we finish deriving the diffusion equation, we'll use it to estimate the eigenvalue of systems with a fissile material and to solve for the distribution or flux of neutrons in the system. In the previous lecture, we took the first and the zeroth moments of the Boltzmann transport equation, which left us with these two simultaneous equations with three unknown variables for the neutron flux, the neutron current, and this leakage second moment of the neutron flux term. These two simultaneous equations are sometimes known as the P1 equations. From here, we're going to make a series of five assumptions to drive the diffusion equation. The first of these assumptions assumes that our system is in a constant or steady state condition. This means that all of our time rate of change terms are equal to zero, and also that our neutron fluxes and neutron currents are not a function of time. This first assumption is simple enough, and the next one is a little more complicated. The second assumption assumes that the flux is only linearly anisotropic, which is another way of saying that the angular flux is only weakly dependent on direction omega. We can decompose the angular flux into a sum of orthogonal basis functions, and from here, we can express any omega-dependent angular flux as a sum of its orthogonal bases, p0, p1, etc., they're weighted by some angular flux constant coefficients, psi0, psi1, etc. An isotropic flux would only require the first of these terms, and the more complicated the angular flux is as a function of omega, the more terms we need to include in this expansion to accurately represent the flux. By assuming that the flux is only linearly anisotropic, we assume that we only need the first two terms in this expansion, and that the flux is only a linear function of omega. If our angular flux is strongly dependent on direction, then this approximation can break down, and we might need to have an omega squared or an omega cubed, etc. term in our approximation here. This approximation is also known as the P1 approximation. The P1 approximation can fail stupendously in some systems, but in general it's a pretty reasonable assumption for thermal reactors, such as light water reactors. In these thermal, water-moderated systems, neutrons are colliding frequently with the hydrogen in the water, which both causes the neutrons to thermalize, and after enough collisions, causes the neutrons to forget the initial direction from whence they came. This neutron amnesia causes the neutron flux to be fairly isotropic and makes it only weakly dependent on omega. So in general, the P1 assumption works well in light water reactors, but when does it not work? The P1 assumption is stupendously incorrect near strongly absorbing materials, such as control rods. Neutrons will stream into these materials, but they won't come out, which creates a directional bias in the angular flux. This assumption also fails near fuel rods. Fuel emits fast neutrons from fission reactions, but the moderator does not emit fast neutrons back. Another example of where this assumption breaks down is between fuel of two different enrichments. The more highly enriched fuel will generally emit more fission neutrons than fuel with a lower enrichment, which causes a directional bias in the angular flux and a net flow of neutrons from the more highly enriched material to the lower enrichment material. So what does this all mean? I've just mentioned several common conditions under which the diffusion equation's assumptions will break down for light water reactors. All light water reactors have fuel of different enrichments and control rods and fuel and moderator in separate regions. But I've also said that the diffusion equation does a good job, in general, of modeling neutron behavior in light water reactors. So what gives? Yes, the diffusion equation breaks down near control rods and at the boundary between assemblies with different fuel enrichments, but if you zoom way out from these localized effects, the diffusion equation does a good job of predicting the overall average behavior of neutrons in a light water reactor. There are also a litany of reactor physicists' tricks that touch up the diffusion equation near these problematic regions. Before we move on, we will eventually be taking the moments of this angular flux expression with respect to omega, and before we do that, it's worth taking a few minutes to explain the math behind how to integrate over this omega variable. Taking the zeroth moment of some constant times omega is fairly simple. 
it requires no vector mathematics and simply integrates d omega over 4 pi, which means that phi ranges from 0 to 2 pi and theta ranges from 0 to pi. As we mentioned earlier, the integral of d omega over all 4 pi is just 4 pi. Integrating some function times omega is more difficult. Omega is a vector, and thus when we evaluate this integral, we must evaluate it for its x component, y component, and z component. After the dust settles, we see that doing this causes each component to integrate out to zero, and thus the integral of omega d omega over all 4 pi equals zero. The integral of omega times omega is even more complicated. This is not omega dot omega, but really the product of two vectors, which is actually a tensor. We're not going to dive too much into tensor calculus, but when we integrate omega times omega d omega, we need to evaluate this integral over all nine combinations of the x and y and z components in the tensor. When we evaluate the xx, yy, or zz components, in other words, the terms in the diagonal, we find that they all equal 4 pi divided by 3. When we evaluate any of the off-diagonal terms, such as the xy term, yz, or zx term, we see that they're all actually equal to 0. Thus, this integral gives us 4 pi divided by 3 times the ux unit vector squared plus the uy unit vector squared plus the uz unit vector squared, which is really just the magnitude of a unit vector, which equals 1. So when all the dust settles, we find that the second moment of some constant with respect to omega just equals that constant times 4 pi divided by 3. If we were to continue this process, we find that the integral of any odd power of omega equals 0, and that the integral of any even power of omega does not equal 0. So what's the point of all this fancy solid angle tensor calculus? Well, if we take the P1 approximation and assume that our angular flux is linearly anisotropic and that it is described by this combination of the scalar flux and the neutron current, then our angular flux actually has some pretty convenient properties. If we take the zeroth moment of this definition for the angular flux, we see that it equals the scalar flux, which is exactly what we would expect according to our definition for the scalar flux. Likewise, if we take the first moment of this angular flux, we see that it equals the neutron current, J. These properties are very good. We want any angular flux that we define to satisfy these two constraints. We want its zeroth moment to be the scalar flux, and its first moment to be the neutron current. We can also take the second moment of this definition for the angular flux to solve it for that pesky second-order leakage term that appeared in our first moment P1 equation. When we do this, we see that the term simply equals one-third times the gradient of the scalar flux. So by assuming that the angular flux is only linearly anisotropic, we have found a way to solve for the second-order leakage term and have reduced our P1 equations into two equations with two unknowns. Now we can solve them. Before we solve these equations, we're going to make three final assumptions. First, we'll assume that our neutron flux is monoenergetic. We will rescind this assumption later on when we want to solve the multigroup diffusion equation, but this approximation allows us to simplify the two moments of the scattering source and the zeroth moment of the fission source, as shown here. Next, we'll assume that our system has no independent neutron sources, which means that the S0 and S1 terms are both equal to zero. This assumption is pretty reasonable in a nuclear reactor. Even though we might see some independent sources of neutrons due to neutrons emitted from cosmic ray production or from our Californium-252 startup source in the reactor, these independent neutron sources generally pale in comparison to the reactor's full-power neutron fission source. Lastly, we'll assume that the mean neutron scattering angle equals the ratio of the first and the zeroth moment of the double differential scattering cross-section. By itself, this is a fair assumption to make, but we will corrupt this assumption later.
These moments of the scattering cross-section are computed using some probability distribution function, usually the scalar flux, and so when we replace the first moment with mu bar times the zeroth moment, we should only really do this for terms that contain the scalar flux. In reality, we will perform this substitution for a term containing the neutron current, which thus introduces a degree of approximation. These five assumptions allow us to rewrite the P1 equations as shown here. We can simplify these equations some more, first by replacing the collisional term and the scattering source term by the sigma absorption term, which we can do since sigma total minus sigma scatter just equals sigma absorption. Next, we'll replace the first moment of the double differential scattering cross-section with mu bar times the zeroth moment of the scattering cross-section, which is just the scalar scattering cross-section for our monoenergetic system. We'll also define the transport cross-section, sigma tr, which equals sigma total minus mu bar times sigma scatter. We'll discuss exactly what this term represents in a minute. From here, we can solve for the neutron current, j, which we see equals negative one-third times the gradient of the scalar flux divided by sigma transport. This relationship is strikingly similar to Fick's law a principle from gas dynamics and mass transfer which describes the rate at which matter diffuses from regions of high concentrations to regions of low concentration. According to Fick's law, the rate at which material diffuses from high concentration to low concentration regions equals the negative gradient of the concentration of that material times that material's diffusion coefficient, d. Because of the similarity between Fick's law and our expression for J, and also because of the historical mindset of thinking of neutrons as a gas that diffuses through a reactor, nuclear engineers have incorporated Fick's law into our equations and have defined the neutron diffusion coefficient to equal 1 over 3 times sigma transport. We can also define a transport mean free path, lambda tr, which equals 1 over sigma transport. By doing this, we see that the diffusion coefficient equals the transport mean free path divided by 3. So what does this all mean? Well, as the neutron cross-sections increase, the diffusion coefficient and the neutron mean free paths will become smaller. This makes sense. Higher cross-sections mean that neutrons will have trouble diffusing far from where they are created. Also, as mu bar approaches 1, then sigma transport decreases, and the diffusion coefficient and transport mean free paths increase. This makes sense too. When mu bar is closer to 1, it means that nuclei will prefer forward scattering events to backward scattering events, and when forward scattering is favored, neutrons will be able to diffuse farther away from where they are initially created. Mu bar is roughly equal to 2 divided by 3 divided by A, the atomic mass of a target nucleus, which means that collisions with lighter nuclei tend to facilitate the diffusion of neutrons through a system. And so, by substituting in the Fick's law expression for the neutron current, we can finally arrive at the neutron diffusion equation. For a homogeneous material, our diffusion coefficients, absorption cross-sections, and fission neutron production cross-sections are all constant, which means that we can rearrange terms in our diffusion equation to yield this expression where bm squared is defined as the material's buckling and is equal to nu sigma fission minus sigma absorption, all divided by the diffusion coefficient. The material buckling essentially describes the amount of oomph that a fissile material has, and systems with larger material bucklings will require smaller critical masses to reach a self-sustaining fission reaction. We'll discuss the material buckling again several times in the following lectures, when we begin solving the diffusion equation, so keep it in the back of your mind for now. We can also formulate this alternative expression for the diffusion equation, which has the form of a Helmholtz equation. Helmholtz equations appear frequently in different fields of physics, where they are often used to describe the behavior of electromagnetic radiation, seismology, acoustics, etc. Physicists have a lot of experience solving Helmholtz equations, and so converting our diffusion equation into this familiar form is usually quite convenient. And thus, we have converted the moments of the Boltzmann transport equation into the neutron diffusion equation, and then again 
into this Helmholtz form of the diffusion equation that we know how to solve. In the following lectures, we'll discuss exactly how to solve this diffusion equation to obtain the eigenvalue and flux for some system. We'll also discuss what boundary conditions we can introduce to this equation as we solve it, and then finally how to compute the critical mass of fissile systems.